All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Billings. I am the tech lead of the Cromwell product here that we'll be talking about. Uh, and I've been here about two years. Um, and I work with the Terra and the FireCloud team to implement features on the Cromwell engine um, running. When, you, when, you're, when you're working with Terra and FireCloud, uh, ultimately, you're working with Cromwell behind the scenes. It's, it's a nice interface to that engine. So I'll be talking about that today and, and Whittle today. Uh, just a show of hands, has anyone here ever written a Whittle? Any of the JTK attendees? Okay, so some people are familiar with it. Um, has everyone, uh, has any of those people submitted it to FireCloud or Terra? Yes? Great. Cool. All right. So the goal we're striving for is to automate the running of pipelines um, by using static scripts. The scripts are, uh, they live in the open, they're auditable, they're reusable, they're modular. You can use scripts that inherit other scripts and we'll talk about that in a second when we look at Whittle. But the goals we're trying to do here is, is to reduce the amount of human error that you would normally encounter if you were to write and maintain your own scripts. These are very static uh, pipelines. They do the same thing over and over again and you bring a new set of inputs and a new set of workflow options and runtime options and submit it to a server uh, on your behalf. So let's take a look at the workflow definition language. So Whittle is comprised of workflows and tasks. The lowest level element you see here is this task stanza. And the idea here is that it's supposed to be, it's designed to be human readable. This is not for computer science graduates who uh, know their way around complex programming languages. It's supposed to be uh, human readable at the, maybe at the expense of some efficiency. So what you see here is kind of uh, the input section. It's implicit. The other, the other sections you see are explicit, but you start off with the input section and you can see that Whittle supports a basic type system. We support files, strings, numbers, arrays, maps, objects. Um, just, just enough to make you productive, but not a, a full type system that you would see in a, in a full programming language. Following the input section, you see the command section. This, this doesn't have to be a one line command, but you see in here that we can reference our inputs uh, by using this dollar sign and braces um, dereferencing notation. So here you, you've declared three inputs and here in your script you're re referring to those inputs and creating um, flags to your, your command. That's followed by a runtime section. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. Um, things like your Docker image that you're gonna be running upon and some other things. Uh, and finally we have an output section where you're taking only the things that you care about from what your job has run and declaring it as an output. So what that means is that from the cloud and from the cloud server, you're going to copy these files off because they're the ones you care about. And ultimately Google Cloud will tear down this instance for you. So once you've declared a task, they get called in a workflow. So work, there's only one workflow um, for a whittle. It can call other workflows, but at the top level, you, you have one workflow declared same thing here where you see input uh, types are declared implicitly, and then you start calling your tasks. We'll get into some patterns you can do here, but this is just a basic example. Uh, we're calling that task A we just declared, and setting inputs equal to the workflow inputs. And this is how you tie workflow inputs to task inputs. Um, again, it's it's pretty explicit, but it, the idea is that um, if you're maintaining this code, you can understand quickly what's going on. So yeah, just some interesting trivia is this, this uh, scripting language was invented at Broad. Um, it's supported by Cromwell. There's at least one commercial offering that I know of, DNA Nexus, that supports Cromwell, uh, supports Whittle. And it's it kind of competes with CWL at the top of the, um, the more well-known bioinformatics uh, scripting languages. All right, so I mentioned before there's some, there's various ways to call your tasks. And 
these end up, uh, you see some common patterns. These are kind of the most basic patterns. There are some other ones not shown here that I'll, I'll touch on for a second, but the, the most obvious one is linear chaining. You can tie, uh, you can call uh, a task and tie, tie the output of that task to another call of a subsequent task. So here we're calling step A and calling step B with the output of that and subsequently calling step C with the, input, with the output of step B as the input. So that's called linear chaining. Multiple inputs and outputs, you can declare multiple inputs and outputs. So, and refer to them specifically, you don't have to refer to um, like an object, like an output as an object and then go from there. They're explicitly named, you can refer to them. And here we're referring to the two outputs of step B as inputs to step C. The final pattern is um, a way you can achieve parallelize, um, parallelized running of a step. So in some cases we have tens of thousands of things going on at the same time and the way we achieve that is by calling a scatter. So you see the syntax down here that we're assigning a variable name to um, each element of the scattered object, in this case input files, and then you can use this variable name in your calls. So what um, Cromwell will do for you is call all these across multiple servers in the cloud and gather up all the outputs for you and then continue on to the next step with uh, this is an array of the outputs of each call. So if this output, step A was output of file, you would have an array of files here that you're passing to step B. Oh, indeed, we see that here. Um, one thing not mentioned here is it, it supports some, some basic logic like if else and expressions. We'll talk about that in a, a little bit more of the expression aspect. Um, but there's a little bit more than what you see here. All right, so I mentioned earlier that there's an explicit runtime section in a task. And you get a lot of power here because you're given control over the environment that the server is running for you. You get control over the server itself, um, how much RAM it has, how much disk space it has, um, what kind of GPU it has. Some of the newer stuff is using um, CUDA and, and machine learning, that sort of thing. Uh, and Google Cloud supports a wide variety of these things. Uh, and also there's a, there's a great way to get cost savings. Um, both Google and AWS support the concept of these preemptible servers. So the idea is that if you have a job that can run in 24 hours or less, you can declare it as preemptible and uh, Google might stop it halfway through and restart it, but it costs a fraction of what a, a, a reserved server would cost. I'm not sure what they call the, the normal servers. But it, it can result in significant cost savings. You can go to this link and find out more. Um, but this is a nice option and, and we plummet through for you. All right. Just make sure. Oh, one more thing I wanted to mention. Yeah, so I did mention we, we, we support uh, expressions. Expressions, things like um, take a number and multiply it by some amount or um, you can read lines out of a file and do all, all kinds of like basic things that you would expect in a, in a programming language. But what you see in, in this stanza is that sometimes people will say, um, you know, memory is two times some input value. So they'll give a value of what they think is good enough to run their workflow and if it turns out not to be, they'll change the input value to two and ultimately they'll, they'll double their amount of, um, of RAM they have on the machine, just something like that. But you see those expressions used often in this runtime stanza. Okay, so another nice thing of Cromwell is that it, it supports multiple backends. And the pattern that we see often is that um, the two most stable backends are your local machine or on a local cluster, like on-prem cluster, and Google Cloud. So the pattern we see is that you can take Cromwell on your local machine, develop a whittle, iterate on it quickly, get, tighten your feedback loop because this is gonna be a lot, fast, lot faster in terms of latency than Google Cloud. And once you've stabilized your whittle, then you can kick it off on Google Cloud at scale. So if you have multiple input files, if you have um, a stable whittle that you're, you wanna run over and over again, you know, at, at whatever uh, pace you, you would like, um, you're no longer bound to whatever your resources on your local machine are, your local cluster. 
Google Cloud is you know, infinitely scalable. Um, this is a very mature back, uh, back end. We've been using it for years. And it, Cromwell manages all these things for you, these cloud components of Google storage. And ultimately, you really shouldn't need to worry about it too much. Okay, so there are, there are two main ways to run. I, I mentioned that you might start off running things locally on your machine to develop your Whittle and stabilize it and work out you know, any kinks into it. And, and for that, we have this, uh, this one-off mode. We, we call it single workflow runner in, in the Cromwell world. Uh, but basically, it's a, it's a Java command. So in Java, you, you package up your binaries as a jar. So here we see that you're passing a, a jar flag to Java. And then you have a series of commands. We'll cover that in the next slide. And your, your inputs, your whittle, your workflow, op, your workflow options, that sort of thing. And this is really just something you would want to use in development. It's not something that you're going to want to stand up and, and, and people are going to be using at scale. For that, we have server mode. So server mode is you kick off uh, Cromwell, and it runs an HTTP server with a lot of API endpoints to help your development and your tracking of your running workflow. This is scalable to thousands and thousands of workflows and jobs. Um, some DevOps needs, this is, you know, you might need a, a MySQL database, that sort of thing, if, you, if, you're, um, if you're pretty serious about uh, separating that. There's also an embedded database that can just save to a file locally that you can use. Um, so you can sort of vary the amount of DevOps work you, you need. And this is really what you want to be using in production. And, and the basic reason is for call caching. So call caching is, at its simplest, it's a way to resume workflows that have been interrupted or canceled. Um, at its most complex, it, like in FireCloud and Terra, you can actually call cache to other people's uh, run workflows and pipelines and receive their results. So instead of you running the same thing that's already been run before, you can short circuit that entire process and get the results because someone else has done it. This is only possible if you have, um, if you have rights to those person's files and that sort of thing. Um, but it's a nice way to, I, I think about 80% or even more is used just as a simple resuming workflows that may have failed for whatever reason or canceled. Um, up here in API endpoints, just a few of them are things like what it's all the metadata associated with a, a workflow, telling you things like, you know, where is it running in the cloud and what Google operations is it, um, how, how far is it advanced and it's running. You can do things like get the logs from a workflow and the outputs after you've run them um, and even query workflows that you've run. So it's pretty, it's pretty powerful and we've, we've covered a lot of use cases in this API endpoint section. Sure. Is it uh, server mode to be run on cluster? Can that be run on cluster? Yeah, so, yeah server mode is available on cluster. It, it, the idea of backends is that it's independent of the front end. So this, this should work on any backend that Cromwell supports. So the, so the question was, does server mode run on um, local mode or server mode? Does server mode run on a local cluster? And the answer is yes. So I talked a little bit about running this locally. When you get started, this is the way you want to go. Um, I mentioned this java-jar syntax. We have, uh, we have two jars, in fact. We have a lighter jar that does things like whittle validation and inputs generation. They all start with this Java syntax of java-jar, and you tell it either WAM tool, which is, it really, it used to be called it should be called Whittle tool. I mean, WAM is an internal representation that Cromwell uses. Um, but if you pass in that binary jar to Java, you can then call commands. And the commands are these, these words right here. So validate, um, inputs, and run. So here, you're going to validate your Whittle. You're going to parse it and make sure it's um, well formed and does parse. So uh, kind of a sanity check on your Whittle. Generating inputs is really useful. When you take uh, someone's Whittle and you want to run it, you have to specify the inputs to it. And that takes the form of a JSON file. You don't have to open up a text editor and write JSON by hand. You can generate a template for it by passing it into this command inputs. 
and passing that Whittle and it outputs into a JSON file. Finally, our, our most full featured endpoint on our command line client is the run command. Um, you see, th this is just a fraction of the flags you can pass in, but at its most basic, you can pass in the Whittle to the run command and the inputs. It will run it in single, in single workflow mode or one-off mode and give you the outputs. There's a lot of output that gives you, we sort of log by default just to give you a lot of information. Um, but the, there's other flags here like specifying workflow options and if you wanna output all the metadata to a file, that sort of thing. And if you get stuck, any of these can be run without any arguments and it'll give you a nice readme of what commands, what arguments can be provided to the endpoint. So if you run, just run with no arguments, you get the readme saying this is how you use run. Okay, that is it. Does anyone have any questions? Question about this uh, slide where um, you had like, Biddle had two ways, local and um, Google. So uh, I, I was wondering in, in this, this one. Case, so one, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Mm. In this, uh, this NFS storage in local, what are the choices there? Um, it's kind of bring your own back end. So this, this is just an example of a common pattern we see like, um, I'm, not, I'm not terribly familiar with the types of clusters, but we see like Slurm, I think SGE is one of them. And um, those cluster setups have some storage that is disassociated from the servers themselves. And that's typically done over this NFS protocol. This is just an example. This is not, it's not you're not bound to this architecture. It's just a common uh, architecture we see when, when running on a local cluster. I mean, this is, this is you know, like is, you see the little SGE here. You could probably simplify this graph if we were just to show it running on your local machine, in which case you would just have Docker installed and it would be using your hard disk on your computer. So this is just a little bit more complicated when we talk about um, cluster architectures. This is just kind of a, a common architecture we see. Sorry, just to add a little context. Uh, this particular graphic is how we do it in DSP. This is how we develop pipelines. We test them locally and then we take them to the cloud. So that's why we have this specific uh, SGE cluster mentioned. But like you said, there's many different ways to do it. Yeah. If I have um, Cromwell in server mode on local cluster, will there be, uh, did you mention, was there a web UI for that? So the UI is intended to be Terra and FireCloud. So there's, there are some UIs out there. Uh, officially, I would recommend just using the HTTP endpoints directly. If it, there's a Swagger page, like Swagger will, <clears throat> we use a, a templated HTTP server so that you can call any of the endpoints by just going to the Cromwell HTTP uh, server. So if you call it up in your browser, it'll tell you all the things you can run and prompt you for each of the inputs. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's not like the most beautiful thing in the world, but it, it lets you run every endpoint and it tells you what inputs are required. So it's, it's kind of a structured way to run HTTP calls instead of like typing out a curl command or something um, really uh, low level. Yep. So I have a question about the scatter. So if I run this window on local machines, how can I control the number of threads for the scan? You already have to use, yeah. it depends on the jobs. Just right. The so that's, that's a good question. So we, we are not a scheduler, so we will just start trying to run everything at once. So if you're scattering wide on your local machine, you're probably not gonna have a good time. Uh, if you're gonna be developing with a scatter, you, you can limit the width of a scatter, but we, we make no, because Google will run n number of jobs at a time, we use that same logic to run even if you're on a local machine. So if you're scattering 100,000 wide, we're gonna try to start 100,000 jobs at the same time. So there's no way to control the, the maximum number of CPUs available? Um, there is in the cloud. There, on your local machine, you cannot control the amount of resources it'll use. It'll just use whatever, it, 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 it has no notion of what do I have it at, at available to me versus 
again, it's not a scheduler, so we're not trying to say what do we have available versus what we're trying to run. We're just running everything. So how about if I put it on a, on a cluster? Well, the, pres presumably you have the amount of resources on your cluster to support that scatter. So we're using the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the presumption, again, we're, we're like, we're basically still just throwing all the jobs at the cluster, and it's up to the cluster to figure out how to run those things. So you, you could overwhelm your, the amount of resources you have in your cluster if you're trying to scatter too wide. So for example, if I only have 10 nodes, so probably it can only run, for example, 20 jobs or so, but I have, for example, you, for, for instance, if I uh, build the pen of normals, I have 100 normals. <coughs> if I run scatter, then they will submit those 100 scatters into the cluster, but I have, well, my cluster only have 20 nodes. So in this way, I'm not sure how the cluster will deal with this situation. Okay, so I'm, I apologize. I, I think I've, I've omitted an important fact here. So there is a way to control the total number of jobs a Cromwell server is running. It's not at the workflow level, but if you spin up a, whoops, if you spin up a Cromwell pointing to a cluster, you can say, I only want this Cromwell to run at many, at most, n number of jobs. It's, it's not gonna, like, you, you, you're not gonna be able to introduce the notion of I only have 20 nodes to run across. You have basically some really high level um, global variables that you can set to control how much, how much resources you'll use at any given time. So if you're gonna scatter 100,000 wide, you can set the number of jobs to run at any time to say 1,000 or 200 or something. Whatever, whatever you can manage on your local cluster and that's that's the tool you have. But this is not part of the script, right? That's right. It's not part of the script. It's part of the Cromwell server options. It's a global setting. It's meant to uh, essentially what you're saying. Like ultimately, I only have so many resources. I I don't want to overwhelm them. So this is a a global setting to make sure I'm not going to go beyond that. Okay. Sure. Yep. So similarly, I've been looking into how to do some work with Cromwell locally at the road before going into the cloud. Yep. And Cromwell is not installed. Uh, there's no Cromwell dot kits on the login. So it is, and I can install it myself. But I then contacted uh, help or IT to say, is there sort of like a way that you recommend, an, an approach that you recommend for testing stuff before going into Terra? And last night I them, they were like, oh, we're escalating this ticket. Um, so I just sort of wanted to throw that out there. It's like, I, I'm very interested in finding ways of debugging my whittles before going onto the cloud. So I think what you're describing is yeah. a nice way to set this up. Uh, the next talk? No. I, I don't have any specific information on that, but you okay, could. So uh, the, we don't have any more talks about this, but we are going to go into a hands-on where we're going to be developing locally on your computer, and we'll show you how you can take the same script that you've been running locally and put it in the cloud. Um, so in that aspect, a little bit. Uh, we don't go into a ton of detail about how to set up a, a Cromwell on a cluster, because um, that's just a little bit too advanced for what we can cover in this day. But we're happy to answer questions if you uh, want to follow up later.